Welcome to Looking Up, A View from the Valley. We're here with Julia Baldini, the Executive Director of the Derby Historical Society in the beautiful David Humphreys House in Ansonia. And today, Julia is going to speak with us and hopefully answer questions about the his history of Derby and also the, how Derby relates to the entire valley. Uh, welcome, Julia. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you for coming by today. I appreciate it. Um, so just to begin with, so people get an idea of kind of your background, um, how long have you been executive director, and sort of what have you done from a historical perspective prior to joining the Derby Historical Society? Well, I joined the Derby Historical Society in uh, June of this past year of 2011. So I've been here for about six months. Um, prior to that, I've worked at some really great uh, Connecticut uh, landmarks and historic houses, including Old Newgate Prison and Copper Mine in East Granby, uh, the Windsor Historical Society, the Old State House in downtown Hartford, uh, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, then I made my way over here. And I have a background, I have a master's in public history uh, with a focus on early American history. Is there anything specific uh, that brought you to Derby as opposed to the other cities in Connecticut? Well, I've spent a lot of time in northern Connecticut and Hartford County um, studying the history up there, and so I really wanted to come down here and really explore other parts of Connecticut, and especially being so close to the shore, studying a lot more maritime history and uh, in the history of the lower Naugatuck Valley. That's excellent. That's terrific. And I think our viewers will really enjoy that. So right here, we're in the, the first room when you come into the David Humphreys house. And we see here we have some things on the table. It, now, what room was this? What was this used for, actually, back then? So right now, we're in the keeping room. And that's kind of your, your uh, jack-of-all-trades room for any colonial house. Um, depending on the size of the houses, many of them didn't have, uh, you know, they didn't have the extra rooms like the front parlor um, or, you know, the less formal par parlors. The keeping room is that's your living room, that's your kitchen, that's where really the heart of the house is. Okay, so for instance on the table here, it looks like we have some old uh, corn, not corning ware, I guess, old old pottery, old potware. Um, is there any significance to that or, or what, what era is that from? Is it revolutionary? Well, uh, meal preparation was an all-day activity because we don't have refrigerators. Um, really, preparing your dinner or your afternoon meal would take all day. So you're going to see a lot of pots over here uh, made from iron, stone, wood, um, things that are you know readily available uh, during the early settlement and colonial periods. Um, and a lot of the foods that are being prepared at this time period, um, a lot of soups, um, you're going to have some uh, wild game, like deer. Do they have desserts, appetizers, those kinds of I mean, you know what I'm saying? How would it compare to uh, a meal of today? Uh, today, Americans, every meal that we have today is almost like a feast. So we really have to think back <laughs> to when people didn't have all these... Uh, didn't have a lot of food and supplies. Everything that you were eating, you were either growing in your backyard or you were getting from your local market or maybe your neighbors, you were trading um, goods for some of the, the food that they were growing in their property. So meals were much more scaled down, um, not anything that we were eating uh, today. Not well, as many courses. That's interesting because when I think of the history, I, I think of, I guess, more recent history, how industrial this area was. Mm -hmm. So if, if you say, like, things are, uh, people were growing things in their backyards, was this area, was, was Derby as a whole more of a farm community, per se, or was it kind of a, a highly settled area, you know, from the beginning? Well, Connecticut, um, Connecticut in general is pretty agricultural. And even um, in more industrial communities, it was standard for people to have a certain amount of land where they had even maybe their own goat goats and their own sheep and their own cows and were growing um, a lot of their own vegetables. People were really um, self-sufficient, self-supportive, but also there's a huge sense of community. So where your neighbor is um, has cows down the street or is making um, making cheese or, or, or you know producing milk, um, people are really sharing that all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's, that's good. I'm sure that made it, that's part of the reason why this area was so well populated. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, but that actually reminds me, uh, if you think about how the people came to this area of Connecticut to begin with, um, you know, historically, uh, people are obviously familiar with uh, coming over the boat on, to Ellis Island, things like that, Im uh, the immigrants coming in. Um, but do you know how the immigrants, let's say, came from Ellis Island and once they were checked in? Did they actually came up to... Uh, to this area of Connecticut? Well, you're going to have, um, because of the industries and because of the development of the railroad um, in the mid-1800s, you're going to have a lot of immigrants who are coming over um, for cheaper labor, especially the Irish um, and later the Italians and the Polish, who are coming and working on those railroads and um, really help building up the industry of the valley. 
that's great. I'm really I'm glad you mentioned all those different ethnicities. That's uh, one of the things I love about the valley. I mean, there's you know Polish festivals, Irish festivals, Italian festivals. You know, the food, the music. It's it's just a terrific place from a cultural standpoint. So that's great. It's great that we can actually point back to the history and see how it you know how kind of evolves. It evolved and changed, but yet a lot of things are still the same. And people you know still speak some of the languages. Of course, you can learn different languages here um, with some of the people that have that were not necessarily born in this country, but have passed on to uh, to things that have happened. Absolutely. Um, I mean, Connecticut, uh, we're, we're a land of immigrants from, from day one. So it, it'd be, you, you really have to acknowledge all the people who've, who've uh, really given blood, sweat, and tears to, to make Connecticut this great state that we are today. Okay. And, and back to yourself, um, do you, what's sort of your ethnic background? Things that where have you done any genealogy research on yourself? Well, what have you found? Um, my family is actually uh, Italian, um, Irish, and uh, French ancestry. Um, what's one a neat thing that is my great grandfather came over and worked in a rock quarry in Suffield, Connecticut, uh, then moved to Bloomfield, and then to Hartford, where my dad was born. De my dad then grew up in Bloomfield and then raised his family in Suffield. So we didn't realize there was this back and forth <laughs> until a couple of years ago. That's <laughs> really interesting. Uh, really neat thing I found out. Yeah, I'm more of a mutt. I am about one. I'm one eighth Polish, German, Romanian, a little bit of Russian. Um, so all different. So yeah. it, it's great. I think that's what, maybe the, one of the reasons why I think that we both appreciate the fact that there's you know sort of this melting pot, not just in the U.S. but just even locally. You can have an area, but that's still you know a diversity within a com within a local community, which yeah. is really nice. I like to think of us as a kind of a stew you know that we're not really melting into so we can't identify anything anymore it's you've got all these different nationalities and they're all working together to make you know to to make this really vibrant arts and culture and uh, you know really great uh, communities that's terrific that's great analogy great analogy <laughs> okay so uh, well, I think we'll, we'll go into the next room now great. so uh, thank you so far so good well, now we're in the study, and we're joined by Christine Boulet. Hi, Christine. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. I'm glad you're to join us today. Oh, this, this is terrific. Uh, so far, we've we've learned a lot just about the general overall scope of mm -hmm. the historical society. Uh, but now we're in the study, uh, and this was whose study? Uh, Reverend Daniel Humphrey's study. He was the Reverend of the Congregational or the Congregational Church here in Ansonia, or then as it was called, Darby. Okay. So how was he related to David Humphrey's, who I and think that, everyone's familiar with? That was David's father. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, was was David an only child? Uh, no, David had three brothers and a sister. So oh. there were six that lived in this house. In the colonial you know, time period, most families were much larger. This was a relatively small family. Oh, really? That's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, um, so the Reverend spent most of his time here. Uh, what were sort of the activities that went on here? What, you know, why did, he, why did he use this as a study? Well, the Reverend Humphreys, of course, was an important figure here in the town of Darby. Being the Reverend of the church, a lot of families and the community looked up to him. All right, So he was important in a way that others would come here and visit. They might seek advice. He was a very well-educated man, so he was also a teacher to the young boys who wanted to continue on to college. So this was kind of his workspace. Uh, he would prepare his sermons here on a weekly basis, entertain other gentlemen within the town, and basically it was kind of a community room for the important gentlemen in the area. Now I know we're right down the street from the first congregational church yes. in Derby. Is, is that who he was affiliated with or was it a different church in town? Uh, no, the original location of the church was of course called also a meeting house and it was located on the top of Academy and Sentinel Hill where it is now in Derby. Mm -hmm. So that's that'd be almost near Whittock Park, kind of thing. Uh, yes, just before that. Okay. And, and as far you mentioned, being well educated, uh, where did he get his education from, and where did his kids hopefully get education from? Okay, where the Reverend Humphreys got his education, I am not aware of that at the moment. But David did continue his education. He did go to Yale. Uh, he was a professor. He was a teacher. Uh, as well as a poet. So David was very well educated, and of course it shows in our history, him being an aide-de-camp to, of course, General George Washington during the Revolutionary War. Uh, what was his specific role with Washington? Or, and I'm sure you must have artifacts from that. Uh, what can you speak to that, that uh, maybe a lot of viewers don't know? Okay, well, uh, David Humphreys, being an aide-de-camp, he was pretty much George Washington's right-hand man. Uh, George Washington is what I'd like to call a very smart man. And in being so, he 
gathered around him very literate and very smart men as well. And David Humphreys, of course, being one of those. David had the gift of writing beautifully. So in bringing people like that, they all worked together and they were able to accomplish what they accomplished, of course, in the success of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know how they actually came to me meet? Do you know how that happened? No, I'm sorry. I really don't. I don't. Well, of course, you know, David was in the Revolutionary War and I'm sure that George realized what a great man he was and how smart he was and realized, you know, I need to have this man on board. That's interesting because, I mean, the, the, when you think about somebody like David Humphreys, who's well-educated, um, you know, what you would call like book smart, yes. but then at the same time was, you know, a, a fighting soldier. I mean, that's an incredible combination yes. if you think about it. So um, what about, um, and David, uh, did he get married at any point? Uh, yes, he did. He married later in life. Uh, he married um, a lovely woman, and they lived here in Derby for a short period of time and then sold the house and moved to New Haven. And of course, that is where David is buried in Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. Was he a married man? Uh, yes, he was. He married later in life, uh, around 1791, to an Anne Francis Bulkley. Okay. Do you know how they meet? Any details? Or uh, the marriage, perhaps? Yes. Well, David Humphreys, after the Revolutionary War, was appointed an ambassador to Spain and Portugal by George Washington. And in his travels, met Anne, and then they did marry. So he. So do you know then at that point, when, if he was an ambassador, was that before the Revolutionary War? Or was it after? How did that work? No, that was after the Revolutionary War. This is after George Washington became president and he appointed David as an ambassador to represent the United States, which really was quite an honor when you consider we were a newly formed country and David was able to represent us as a country to other places. Back to the study, you, you mentioned things about uh, the Reverend, his father, um, mm -hmm. doing some of the sermons here. Um, does, for instance, does the Historical Society actually have any archived copies of any of those sermons or things like that? No, unfortunately we don't. And unless somebody or another family out there <laughs> has some artifacts they'd be willing to donate to us, uh, we don't really have anything available at this well, time. That, that's terrific that you, uh, you, know, you appeal to our viewers because, I mean, how often, let's say, do you, or, or what percentage do you get things from the outside world, per se, versus people already in the Historical Society or members who would contribute? How does that work? Uh, well, basically, what we look for as far as artifacts and things to be donated to the Society is we're mainly looking for items that encompass the history of the Derby and the Lower Nautuck Valley area. Uh, if families, you know, can think about us to bring things in, we, we try and remind families that we would like to keep track of our history. Uh, we like to keep it alive and try and remember what has happened in the past. And unless families don't donate these things, then we can't trace them. And it's amazing how I hear of so many items that families have destroyed or gotten rid of, where if we had just the chance to look at it, and we could have saved some mm -hmm. history. Yeah, that's a shame. You're right. Yes. But, but fortunately, you've been able to save a lot of stuff here. Yes. The thing that you mentioned, Derby, and then also with respect to the Naugatuck Valley, because, uh, again, that's one of the goals of this show, is to cover, you know, at least for the purposes of this show, all seven towns. So my understanding is it was actually the, the area we know as the valley was literally all called Derby at one point, or Darby as it was, and now it's kind of, and then over time the other cities broke um, broke off. So do you know kind of in general how that happened? Uh, well, of course, it, Darby was settled in the 1650s, or that's when families started moving to this area. They migrated from Milford. They needed more property because they had large families and they needed more farmland to grow. Mm -hmm. um, as the families got larger and the children married off, they needed more land. So it kept growing. And towns that we now call today Derby, Ansonia, Seymour, Oxford, part of Woodbridge and part of Beacon Falls was all Derby at one point. So it was very, very large. And then as time goes on, like anything else, uh, certain sections of the town felt, well, you're favoring another part of the town. Mm -hmm. Let's form our own. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, history is made, and we've all broken into smaller right. places. Right. I, I didn't hear you mention Naugatuck or Shelton. Now, now, now uh, we consider them part of the valley. Where Were they their own entities, just separate from the overall derby? Or how did, how did those two work out? 
I'm not absolutely positive the chain of events, like with Shelton, it was part of other towns on the other side of the Housatonic River. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as the Naugatuck Valley or the Naugatuck itself, I'm not sure when Naugatuck was settled. They have a great historical society there. You can talk to them. <laughs> had a girl, had a girl. I think later on we're going to be able to see some maps of some of these, some of the old mm -hmm. scale maps. Yes. Um, like, for instance, uh, I always thought, like when I heard the term Birmingham, I thought that was kind of what you would describe, that it was maybe parts of Ansonia, Shelton, and Derby. But Birmingham, as I understand it now, it, it, it was just kind of the downtown region of Derby was yes. referred to as Birmingham. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. It was the borough of Derby. It was a, a borough of Birmingham along the river where all of the industrial area was. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Pam Lorenzo. I'm the chair of the Valley Early Childhood Task Force. And for those of you who are wondering about kindergarten registration, kindergarten registration for the following towns will take place in January of 2012. In Ansonia, it will be at the Resource Fair at Prendergast School on January 21st from 9 to 1 p.m. We do have a snow date of January 28th. In Derby, at all of the elementary schools between the week of January 17th and January 20th. In Seymour, we will also be doing registration at all of the elementary schools from January 10th through January 12th, and also at the Seymour Public Library, January 11th through the 25th, between 5 and 7 p.m. And Shelton, we will do also at all the elementary schools, the week of January 22nd. Remember, kindergarten is the foundation for future learning. Thank you. So now we're in the parlor of the David Humphreys house and we're joined by Elaine Brandon. Hello Elaine, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Um, appreciate coming here. This has been great so far. We've learned a lot about the history of David Humphreys and, and, and the Naugatuck Valley. Um, so before we get into that again, uh, what is your background uh, as far as your affiliation with the Historical Society in Derby? I became a lifetime member in 2004 when I retired from teaching and they nicely asked me to join the education committee and that's where I started after I was volunteering and now I'm on the planning and development which is for nonprofits a fundraising committee. So you do a lot of really important work for the society. Uh, you said you were on the education committee so what does that mean? Is that educating the public? Is it educating other members like yourself? It's for our 1762 program and which we have a fifth grade program which is that and then we have a, we started that year a program the 1759 program for third graders so our fifth graders come into the Humphreys house and they do the, the spinning the weaving and the cooking and they also go on a tour of Elm Street and then they enjoy each other's company here for the food that's been cooked. You mentioned two dates. You said 1762 and 1759. What are the significances of those dates? Those were the ages of uh, David Humphreys, um, and when he, in, basically when he was in school at those times. Mm -hmm. So one's a fifth grade program, one's a third grade, and it's basically brought, bringing us back the students with a hands-on program for 1762, uh, what it was like in the colonial times. Oh, I see. So you're picking the date or the year that he was the same grade as the kids now who are actually attending this. Basically. That's and the third grade program, our docents go into the buildings, into the schools, mm -hmm. and they have a bag full of goodies, and one of them is a horn book, which is on the table in um, the other room. They are given the supplies to make the books. Mm -hmm. Now, a horn book, that was back in the, the one-room schoolhouse, if yeah, I remember from my history yes. class? <laughs> yes, 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 it was. So, um, they, are they, the docents bring a bag full of material and the students could put it together. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing that particular program? Four years now. Because mm -hmm. it was the year after I joined that I became, we, we worked on it. And the docents go to, I believe two docents will go into the classrooms. And they also bring the cl somewhat clothing and they talk about the food and about how 
David Humphreys would have learned then. And as we mentioned, early, found out earlier, and he was a, ended up being a very well-educated man, going to Yale, et cetera. Right. So. And I started a sponsorship program with another uh, board member two years ago, um, asking for donations for the programs so we can continue running them as nicely as we've been doing. And that, so that's part of my fundraising, the sponsorship for our educational program. Okay, well, let's talk about that a little bit, the fundraising. Where uh, we had mentioned that, you know, if someone was interested in donating to the uh, historical side, they could just outright donate. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be a member, though, to donate. Is that correct? No, you don't. Anybody can donate, and they can call the Derby Historical Society at 735-9108. On the Internet, they can go in and look for the Derby Historical uh, website. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually a lot of the information uh, prior to this... Uh, visit uh, got off your, your internet website. It's a, it's a terrific site. It's got a lot of great um, facts, a lot of it, and some of the things uh, just not just about the history per se or what you'll learn in the house, but also just about the society itself, how it got formed, how it works with the other uh, communities. Uh, now I believe you, you're on other societies besides just Jer Derby, is that correct? I'm a member of the Seymour Historical Society, however I'm active at the Derby Historical <laughs> Society. <laughs> And that, and I've enjoyed it, and I've learned a lot of history, and I want to can help have it continue. So I'm also doing the annual appeal, which we started a while ago, but it's still continuing. And again, if anybody would like to find out any information, they can call us here. Uh, Christine is available, and Julia is available. And I can repeat the phone number. It's 735-9108. Uh, I'm still contacting people making sending out information on our annual appeal and our programs that's held usually at grassy hill lodge is that it's correct held at grassy hill lodge and that's held in november mm -hmm. and that right now uh we just finished with what's 12th 12th night uh it's like the epiphany of that time of the colonial times that was a, a week ago and uh, people come here and there's plenty of food and the hearth is glowing with a beautiful fire, mm -hmm. and there's entertainment according to that period. Mm -hmm. So we've done that. Uh, we are also doing, oh, excuse me, in December at the beginning, our gift shop is opened. We have many nice things, including doll clothes that are homemade by our docents also. Now you mentioned docent, that's D-O-C-E-N-T. What is that exactly? Well, I'm dressed up in a costume of that time. Want me to stand up? Sure. All right. I have um, basically what they would be wearing. I have a, the cape on, but I can remove it. And I'm dressed as the docents would be dressed as a colonial or lady in that time. And they, we talk about the David Humphreys house, we talk about the times, and of course with the children are coming in for our fifth grade program, we're leading them through either, as I said, the weaving, a carding of wool, a spinning of the wool, and the cooking. So, and the, we all have a name, and the children all have names of people at that time. Okay. Oh, so that's, so that it wouldn't be their, their, their current name, they take on a persona they of somebody who was out there. Persona, right. So this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to keep the programs going. It's hands-on. It's really great for us and for any child, not just in Derby or in Sonia. It's in this whole region. We have schools coming. I believe it was in, in the articles recently about uh, the Valley Community Foundation, who does an enormous amount of work for this area. Um, they, I believe, uh, either provided you a grant or provided you with some funds for some of them. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe if you know specifically even where those funds went to? Well, the f you have to have a specific reason, not running. Uh, for We ask for grants for our programs, getting new programs and trying to build upon what we have. And these grants are for help projects that we are intending to create and go forward from. Um, we're always looking to do new, new things for the students and for this historical society. And that. Uh, I also, right now, I'm trying to, we're having an open hearth meal. Um, that it's an auction 
for six people, and it's another money raiser. And it's our docents are here, and it's just mm -hmm. it's an open hearth. As the food was cooked in the colonial times over the open hearth, it's now this may be sort of a basic question, but what would, when you use the word term hearth, which is H E A R T H, right? Mm -hmm. um, how is that different? Like if I say fireplace versus hearth, is there any difference between that, or are they basically synonymous? Well, I think it's similar to a fireplace, but this is the hearth is where they did all their cooking. And you'll see at the beginning, the heart, that's a hearth that's closed up over there. But we, they, cook, they cook on the hearth, if you've noticed on the, the beginning, the, the bar coming across. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They had their hot meals mm -hmm. in there where they made their stews and soups. And that's what our, our students make. They make a stew in mm -hmm. that. You didn't see in your film where we cook our meat. Mm -hmm. And they have it on a spit. And we, for our open hearth auction, we do a, a ham or a pork roast oh, wow. or a turkey. <laughs> Right in the hearth. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, the uh, that annual appeal takes place right around Thanksgiving. So, have you ever thought of combining the turkey on the hearth with your annual appeal? I've never thought of having it here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that one of the reasons is this is too small. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's that's probably a good thing to have because you have so many people come to your annual appeal. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that's our our large money maker, our mm -hmm. largest fundraiser. Mm -hmm which I said is still going on even though we had the reception in November and that. But it's an annual appeal and any monies that we can raise to support the Derby Historical Society mm -hmm. um, is important for us to continue our programs and continue having the David Humphreys House opened and available. It is a definite hands-on situation for everybody in the Valley. I'm Pam Lorenzo. I'm the chair of the Valley Early Childhood Task Force. And for those of you who are wondering about kindergarten registration, kindergarten registration for the following towns will take place in January of 2012. In Ansonia, it will be at the Resource Fair at Prendergast School on January 21st from 9 to 1 p.m. We do have a snow date of January 28th. In Derby, at all of the elementary schools between the week of January 17th and January 20th. In Seymour, we will also be doing registration at all of the elementary schools from January 10th through January 12th, and also at the Seymour Public Library, January 11th through the 25th, between 5 and 7 p.m. And Shelton, we will do also at all the elementary schools the week of January 22nd. Remember, Kindergarten is the foundation for future learning. Thank you. If you have any comments on the show, feel free to provide feedback, questions, or suggestions to lookingupvalley at gmail.com or check out our Facebook page and dedicated website. Thank you very much.